Good morning. I am Sharon Pender, President and CEO of the Capital Region Minority Supply Development Council and the operator of the MBDA Center of Washington, D.C. and the MBDA Federal Procurement Center. So welcome. Again, welcome to Hot Sheets Live webinar. As we move through this hour, please remember it's a webinar. And the beauty of a webinar is that we leverage the technology and our bandwidth and we come straight to you in your homes. Close down those windows for possible interference. But the Hot Sheets newsletter was started a few weeks ago as we focused on surviving the, the pandemic for minority businesses. So for your shelter in place pleasure, please find our previously um, produced newsletter and our previous webinar at www.crmsdc.org. Um, but let's just get started. And I'd like to invite you to um, introduce you to our team of experts that are joining us today. So if we're having an exclusive conversation, and gentlemen, if you can join me on screen, I would certainly appreciate it. Okay, wonderful, everybody's here. And we have one person that's going to be on the phone. What you have in front of you, and we'll um, actually give you this information a little bit later, or just, you know, the names and the contact information. But let me just share just a tidbit of information about a couple of our folks. And we're real grateful. Because if you think of our topic today about emergency management, right, and we have these folks for an hour, we're really grateful um, that they're here. So welcome, Mr. Jorge Castillo. Um, he is the Maryland COVID-19 Joint Information Center External Affairs Manager, Branch Manager for the Maryland em Emergency Management Agency. And that's MEMA, right, Jorge? That is correct, Sharon. No, you know, actually, um, I'll tell you a joke about MEMA. It's like a name for a grandmother, too. But during his ten tenure at Passport Health, now the largest provider of um, immunization of the U.S., he consulted with dozens of clients and performed pandemic preparedness and disaster recover, recovery gap analysis and pandemic emergency plans. His leadership background also includes hands-on experience in emergencies, emergency response during the 2009 H1N1 swine flu pandemic outbreak, including disaster preparedness, communications and outreach, incident management and stakeholder networking initiatives and in field operational and nonprofit environments. Thank you, Jorge, for joining us today. We have, and we have by phone in real time because emergency management is real. Mr. Curtis Brown, he serves as the Deputy, D Deputy State Coordinator at the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. Is that VDEM, Curtis? He has yes, homeland v v v He has homeland security and emergency management policy experience at the federal, state, and local levels. Previously, Curtis served as a regional emergency management administrator for the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, professional staff in the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Homeland Security, and senior special assistant to the governor in the Office of Commonwealth Preparedness. And then we have back by popular demand, because we have a hot and burning topic today, is none other, none other than Mr. Antonio Das, District Director of the SBA Washington Area District Office. He was appointed to, in 2013 as District Director, and Mr. Das and his team provide business development assistance to the SBA largest portfolio of firms participating in the 8A business development program. Additionally, as district director, he oversees delivery of SBA small business financing programs, as well as um, contracting programs and entrepreneurial um, services. Welcome, Antonio. Well, thank you, Sharon. It's great to be here. It's great. And Antonio, how many other district directors are there across the country? We have 68 district offices, so there are 67 more of me around the country. Okay, but none other like you, and we're glad you're here. So thank you. And of course, rounding off our team, we have part of our consortium team, Mr. Tommy Marks, who heads up the federal, the MBDA Federal Procurement Center for us. And then we have Mr. Dennis Smith, who heads up our MBDA um, Washington D Business Center, Washington, Washington, D.C. So thank you um, very much, gentlemen, for joining us. 
And as we kind of look, you know, I'd like to take a poll. We have many people, there's, ooh, hundreds of people have joined us for brunch. And I want to take our first poll, if we could. And given this topic um, that we're dealing with, does your company, um, did your company rather submit an application for any of the stimulus relief funds? Check all that apply. Whether you submitted an application for payroll protection program or the idle program or any other related programs, check one of those. And we're gonna come back to that data in just a few minutes. Okay, but right now, I'm going to ask our um, guest if they would um, come back in a few minutes because we wanna get started on our first, uh, I'm sorry, we wanna get started just looking at our agenda. Okay, so here's what's happening today. It's um, doing business with MEMA and BDEM, and then we're going to talk about PPP runs out of money, so what next, and then we're going to have an open check. And throughout the day or throughout this hour, um, ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you submit questions in the question box, and at an appropriate time, we ask that you raise your hand, just like in church or school, um, if you want to be called on. And, um, and so, gentlemen, everybody but Tommy, if I could um, bring you in just a little bit later, that would just be an awesome thing. So, Tommy, I want to start a, the, the conversation with you as we talk about what happened. And I think this level setting, this part of the conversation is important about what happens in, in that it, and we talked about this at our last webinar, but it kind of sets the stage as to why this, uh, this conversation today with our local, what I'll call our local FEMAs is important. So Tommy, I've been sheltered in and the thing that's been happening to me over the last couple of weeks is I've been expanding in size. I've grown two dress sizes, but seriously, there's a little bit more that has happened since March the 13th. Can you kind of recap that for us? Yes, as we know, uh, you know, the key thing was the president declared that national emergency and then which actually activated the federal emergency management agency in order to deal with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Uh, and with that comes, uh, some, some other national partners at the federal level that FEMA depends on, which includes uh, the Corps of Engineers, the Red Cross, uh, the Defense Logistics Agency, uh, SBA, and in particular their disaster loan folks, uh, along with uh, a number of faith-based groups. Uh, and that also turns on the governors of our states, which in this case, every governor has declared uh, an emergency in their state, which then activates the system process for money to flow to the governors through their uh, emergency management uh, agencies, which is really the key uh, down at the state level uh, handling disasters. And every okay. state has one. In and, and what you said is just real key and it sets the tone for what our conversation is about is that it filters down when an emergency is, it, emergency is declared, it filters down to the state level, the governors are in charge and we have seen a lot of things taking place um, and we can get into uh, what some of the governors are saying, but let's, we selected today two of our local FEMAs to have the conversation with. And, and I'm gonna turn that part of that conversation over to you, Tommy, so we can bring in um, Jorge back from MEMA and understand that there is a um, introductory piece that we're gonna be looking for at. I'm a, a visual kind of person, so I appreciate looking at that. Um, and if you're on the phone only, if you're in phone only mode, you may not um, see, you definitely won't see what's going on, but for 60 seconds, you may not hear anything, but hang in there with us. And I'll turn this over to you and Jorge. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much, Sharon. And, and it is indeed, indeed my pleasure to uh, be able to sit today with of her, Jorge uh, Castillo from the Maryland Emergency Management Office, and then later on we'll talk to Curtis uh, Brown from Virginia. And so uh, Jorge should be coming up right now. He's on. He's on. Okay. So um, Jorge, uh, it is definitely again a pleasure to be with you, and uh, understand you've got some uh, some things you want to talk to us about, uh, and that will begin with a video that uh, you brought to us. 
Yes, Tommy, thank you for the for the opportunity. Um, Sharon, are we showing the video now or are we showing it uh, afterwards? We can, we can certainly show it now. The Maryland Emergency Management Agency is an all hazards agency. We plan for, coordinate, and respond to a number of natural hazards which are common in Maryland, such as hurricanes, snowstorms, flooding, and severe storms, as well as man-made hazards and public health threats, such as the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. I'm Chaz Eby, I'm the Deputy Executive Director here at the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Responding to COVID-19 has been very challenging because it's such a complicated public health emergency that involves so many people, so many communities, and all of our state and local partners. We are working with many of them here at the Maryland Emergency Management Agency in our State Emergency Operations Center. MEMA is a vital component of the Maryland Military Department. We, we do work closely with the Adjutant General, and all of the other pillars of the Maryland Military Department. The Maryland National Guard is one of our key partners, especially during response operations. It's really important that all of government work together along with our private sector and nonprofits. And that's what's so great about the Maryland Emergency Management Agency is that we are the team that is coordinating all of those efforts and trying to work together to mitigate harm and respond efficiently. So you, so you can't back, you can't come to the poll? If, if you will, uh, can, can you talk to us about uh, what MEMA actually is going through now and, and some key things that you're looking for in the way of assistance from, uh, from the, the vendor community? Yes, yeah, so um, uh, hopefully that, that video explained um, a little bit more of, of what we do. Um, we are, you know, we, we uh, coordinate uh, the state response for all hazards. Uh, so that includes um, storms, severe weather, um, uh, snowstorms, uh, hurricanes, uh, and um, uh, potentially man-made uh, hazards uh, as well. Um, in addition to that, we also coordinate the state's response with all the agencies for COVID-19. Uh, and that has been something that uh, we've been doing since uh, January 20th. Um, and as the situation has uh, evolved, our state emergency operations center has also gone through different stages of activation and staffing uh, to make sure that we are uh, able to to respond to this uh, situation. Um, so that's th that's that's what we do. Really, our our coordination uh, may be a little bit different based on uh, the. Uh, the, the situation that we find ourselves, but at the end of the day, we're the agency that plans for, coordinates, and responds to uh, these hazards uh, or disasters. Uh, and, and, and we're in charge of making sure that uh, all of the agencies are responding, re responding appropriately uh, and that we're coordinating their actions so that we have a uniform uh, response to, to, to the threat. Um, in terms of your second question, um, what can individuals do? What can this group do? I think the most important thing, and I can almost guarantee you, uh, and and correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe this is a poll that we can take. Uh, how many of your members actually have a disaster preparedness plan or a contingency plan? Um, and I can tell you from my time in small businesses that the answer is the majority of them do not have them. Uh, as an entrepreneur, as a small business owner, you are the CEO, you're the tech guy, you're the marketer, you're the procurement officer, you're the HR officer, you're doing all these things and planning for emergencies, planning for something like this is uh, not um, at, at, at the top of, of mind. So one of the most important things that I could tell um, your members to do is to join our private sector integration program. Uh, and we'll be happy to send more information on that through Sharon and, and the link as well. Uh, and this program will allow you to um, be part of our um, private sector um, and uh, receive information that is authoritative and embedded and timely um, throughout um, uh, non-emergency periods as well, which is very important. You know, we want to build those relationships 
before a global pandemic. Uh, we want to make sure that we know what the private sector needs are. Uh, and as we get more and more members in this private sector integration program, which we call PSIP, um, PSIP, uh, we are fine tuning it to really be responsive to our members' needs. Um, and our members vary from small businesses to medium sized to large corporations and transnational global entities like, Nation, uh, like NASA, for example. Um, so uh, once again, the, the single most important thing that I would recommend um, that, that individuals in this call do is to check out our private sector integration program, um, join it, apply for it. Uh, it doesn't take that, that much uh, time to do so. Um, and then you'll be able to, um, to be part of, of MIMA's uh, PSIP. Uh, and, uh, and and receive information, uh, as well as opportunities to train with us, um, et cetera. So that that would be my my number one recommendation for everybody here. And, and that's that's a, that's a that's a, a, a very key answer because you know we we talk about what happens with FEMA at the national level, and you need to be in the, the disaster response registry if you're uh, one of work disasters. Uh, how does that tie to 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 the state level? Uh, because as a vendor, uh, we see all the money that's flowing through FEMA, but again, again, most of that money ends up down at the state level in order to get the, because the priorities are set by the state. And so. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and all, um, all emergencies, as we say, you know, all, all emergencies are local. Uh, definitely the local emergency management offices uh, are the ones that handle the you know the the, the response they're they're the, the the ones who are there uh that doesn't mean that mima doesn't send uh for example teams to assist uh, incident management teams or imts uh so we do have boots in the ground to do a variety of things uh but the emergencies are handled at the local level by the emergency um offices um so in terms of procurement and contracting um you know the the the, the rules to follow uh, would would be the same uh, as if you were um, registering uh, to be a, a vendor for the state. Uh, you know we're we're going to be looking at those lists depending on the the needs that we have. Um, there are also opportunities for companies that don't necessarily have to sell us things, uh, but uh, within their capacity, their networks. Uh, the people that they have, they can assist us in a variety of ways, uh, whether it's translation or whether it's helping uh, uh, donate um, uh, information, whether they have uh, access to communities that are underserved, uh, communities in need, especially minority communities. Um, so it's not just what can we sell to MEMA, is how can we be part of this organized effort because at the end of the day, um, as, as you can see with COVID-19, nobody is immune. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're a small business owner or a CEO of, of Nike, um, the virus can, can get you and, and disasters can happen. So um, our vision is to shape a more resilient Maryland where communities thrive and we don't say, rich communities or African-American communities or Latino communities or underserved communities. We say all communities. So we want all of the communities to join us. Um, and, and the easiest way to do it once again would be through the, through the private sector um, and, and you'll, you'll receive more information um, through, through our liaisons. All right, so as I close out, I, I just want to clarify, as I understand, when you say local level, that means I need to know what's happening. I'm in Prince George's County, I need to know what's happening at their level with their emergency because that's where it's going. That's where I need to start. Okay, exactly. I really exactly. appreciate it. We're going to bring you back uh, uh, at the end for some Q and A, but I really appreciate the, the comments. And uh, we're going to transition to your your colleague over in the Commonwealth of Virginia, Mr. Curtis Brown. Yeah. Curtis, you still with us? Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. So again, we welcome Mr. Curtis Brown. And Curtis, uh, to you in the state of Virginia with VDEM, uh, talk us through the, the relationship you all have with FEMA, the whole process that 
that we're talking about and where I should go as a contractor. I'm looking to help you out. Sure. Uh, th and thanks again for, for having us on. Really appreciate the opportunity to connect with uh, uh, the small business community, especially uh, small women and minority owned businesses. Uh, we view uh, disaster preparedness as a whole of community uh, team sport. It really takes all of us to, to deal with these very massive catastrophic disasters. And this pandemic uh, uh, response is a clear example of that. Uh, VDM, similar to where Jorge mentioned, is a state emergency management agency. Uh, we support our local governments uh, during time of emergencies. Um, during blue sky days and before emergencies, we're constantly doing training and planning and exercising, preparing for disasters. We work collaboratively with FEMA. Uh, we are a pass-through agency for uh, FEMA uh, funding, uh, both preparedness grants as well as uh, mitigation and recovery uh, funding. Uh, we speak with them and work with them on a weekly basis. Of course, during a disaster, uh, coordinating the logistics and the resource needs that have come up as a result of this historic disaster. So. As it relates to the role of the private sector, uh, again, we do not have a, a state factory making personal protective equipment. Uh, we need the private sector to support that, uh, also to support us with analytical services and, and, and other services. So uh, part of our major role is coordinating the logistics to get the needs that we have uh, across the Commonwealth. Uh, clearly, uh, we're historically uh, have worked within the you know s snowstorm or hurricane or or regional uh, large scale flooding event. Uh, these things have occurred more often and frequently and more impactful in recent years. Uh, clearly, with COVID nineteen uh, being a pandemic event, we are uh, actively have been uh, looking for equipment related to personal protective equipment, uh, masks, surgical masks, gloves. Uh, disposable isolation gowns, face masks, and medical goggles, again, to support our hospitals and um, uh, nursing homes. Uh, for other events, uh, the events I mentioned, snowstorms, hurricanes, et cetera, uh, usually looking for uh, fuel, uh, prepackaged and, and uh, shelf-stable meals and hot meals, uh, bottled water, snow removal, uh, and, and IT equipment. Uh, but again, uh, it it runs the gambit of needs. Uh, again, these needs have been coming up more frequently uh, because of more impactful and frequent uh, weather. Uh, we are we want to be in the Commonwealth of Virginia very intentional in terms of our outreach and collaboration with small uh, women and minority-owned businesses. Uh, we've been taking some uh, very intentional actions in recent years to increase our uh, the participation of those businesses. I do want to recognize the collaboration from. Uh, the Virginia Department of General Services, as well as the Virginia Department of uh, Small Business and Supplier Diversity, who are our partners in this space, who we work with collaboratively to identify increasing opportunities for uh, uh, what we call SWAM, uh, small, small women and minority-owned businesses. Uh, we're constantly tracking the information um, and finding new opportunities to do that. Uh, within our unified command for the COVID-19 response, we have a private sector working group who is uh, coordinating uh, information sharing uh, with the private sector. Uh, if you go to our website at vaemergency.gov and search for private sector, you'll uh, go to the page where you can uh, sign up to uh, join the private sector portal uh, where you can get information about uh, vetted, good information about what we're doing as it relates to uh, two-way communication sharing with the private sector. We're also having a, a weekly conference call on Wednesdays uh, with the private sector to keep them up to, updated uh, on our actions. You do, uh, and it's, it has the opportunity for question and answer. Uh, you do have to sign up on the uh, on the portal though. So if you go to vaemergency.gov and uh, search for private sector, you'll get that information. Uh, secondly, uh, we also have an equity working group. A health equity working group is a part of our uh, unified command and we're focused strategically on disproportionate impact uh, we know that this emergency is not only having disproportionate impact on communities of color uh, uh, elderly and people with uh, pre-existing uh, conditions but from an economic standpoint 
uh, 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 disproportionate impact on small uh, women and minority owned businesses. So we want to be intentional in our outreach and our efforts and identifying opportunities for uh, those businesses that support the response. Um, so um, uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Tom. We've got a couple other things, but I'm sure will come up in our conversation. Curtis, a, a, a great rundown, great rundown, because of course I had in my mind, where do I go and register in Virginia in order to be on that list as a vendor uh, to provide provide assistance, potential provide assistance. So this time we bring up Jorge back with Mima and uh, and we have uh, Ms. Penders back on and we'll go to our Q&A for this session. We want to provide the opportunity for those that are online to be able to ask questions of our experts, Mr. Jorge Castillo and Mr. Curtis Brown. And so we have with us today, assisting us with managing, which looks like a lot of questions there, um, Mr. Ken Clark, who is with our MBDA Center, um, Washington, DC, and Sonia Bigelow-Smith, who is our business development director for CRMS DC. So folks, what do you, what do you think in terms of questions now? Uh, the first question I have is for Mr. Castillo. Uh, our company, uh, it says, uh, has uh, a full set of N95 masks, surgical masks, uh, plastic shields, and other PPE. How should I go about getting our company in, uh, into the bid process? Um, so um, the easiest thing right now would be for you to send um, an email to P Sector, that is P S E C T O R at Maryland.gov. Um, and as you can imagine, we have received hundreds of, of these um, inquiries uh, about equipment, uh, about protective equipment, especially. So please be patient as we go through these. Uh, but that that would be the, the the best way. As soon as you send that, uh, we'll reply back to you um, with a, a questionnaire um, for you to fill, which is also not uh, not tremendously exhaustive, but it gives us an opportunity to put you in, in categories. Um, and then after that, depending on the need, well, we'll we'll go down the list uh, and contact you in in the event that we need your equipment and can use it too. Next question, or did we, was that for Jorge or for Curtis as well? I think we should ask the same question for Curtis, although he did indicate um, more about that private sector group, but Jorge, uh, just, I mean, Mr. Um, Brown, just for clarity, would you answer that question also? Uh, sure, um, on the, uh, in, in, on my contact information at the end of the presentation, there's two email addresses that uh, vendors can email. I suggest emailing both uh, with details on what type of services and goods they have to offer. Uh, this allows us to uh, immediately uh, have our Department of General Services uh, follow up and to track uh, what goods or service you have to uh, offer in terms of paid, uh, but also if you have donations. Um, our uh, EVA system, uh, EVA, is our procurement registration system for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, the Department of General Services uh, manages that. I suggest that all uh, uh, businesses uh, go ahead and register for the EVA system uh, where they provide their you know, uh, information, address, uh, contact information, uh, uh, business uh, certification information. Uh, then you'll be officially in our system and you'll have an opportunity to uh, get communications about opportunities uh, also, if you go on the Department of Small Business and Supplier Diversity website, you can go through the process of being registered as a small women and minority owned uh, business. Uh, if you click on the Get Certified uh, tab on the homepage. And so those are two, two ways in which to kind of get ahead of the process. Uh, we are trying to expedite things clearly because it's a disaster. But I do uh, recommend registering on EVA and if you're uh, a, a small woman and minority owned business, uh, registering for that designation as well. Thank you. We have time for perhaps one more question, but I wanna tell you that we are collecting all of the questions that you're sending to us today. And our process has been, is that we will address all the questions and then 
send out the responses in about a week for questions that we don't get to today. We are going to bring these gentlemen back at the end of our segment, um, at closer to the end of the hour, where we will open it up to questions and some live questions as well. But let's just take one more question for these gentlemen so that we can move on to the next segment. Good morning, Sharon. Thank you for that. Um, we do have a question for Raya, and she wanted to know from uh, both Mr. Casillo and Mr. Brown whether or not the departments are prioritizing in-state companies for these products and services. Thank you. Um, so just a quick answer uh, to that. Um, yes, um, if you go also to uh, procurement.maryland.gov, that's procurement.maryland.gov, uh, you will find a link to, towards the top of the page um, that is an emergency contracts and supplier list. Uh, those are for specific contract needs um, that, that are needed uh, right now. Um, so that, that would be something that I would recommend as well. And also that, that allows you to be registered in, in, in the system. So uh, that is a way that, that the, the state is prioritizing um, the, the services. And that's once again, procurement.maryland.gov. Okay, excellent. Mr. Brown? Uh, yes, uh, we, we definitely do uh, want to reach out to Virginia uh, businesses as well as SWAM, you know, clearly SWAM businesses as it relates to this uh, disaster. Uh, clearly given the, the large scale need for PPE, uh, we have been competing for some of the, the, the larger uh, bulk orders, but even with that effort, we've been trying to be very intentional, even if it's a smaller order that we can get in state, uh, one, we can get it faster and we get it from uh, a, a business here in Virginia, a small business in Virginia that can help uh, to, uh, to support our uh, recovery as it relates to our economy. So yes, we want to be very intentional and focused on that. Okay, excellent. Gentlemen, we are grateful for your appearance here today. If you would hang in there with us for a few more moments after we talk about the SBA and the PPP program, and we'll come back and open it up for general questions, we would certainly appreciate it. I want to thank you again. We thank the governors of, of the state of Maryland and the governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia for um, having the wherewithal and the foresight to having you in charge of, of things that matter, uh, particularly during this particular point in time. So we'll see you back in a few minutes. Thank you. Tommy, thank you. So, you know, um, we, we took a, um, a poll at the beginning of the hour and that had, um, so if we could just show the results of that, with 200 people kind of reporting on it. Um, we had, out of the 200 people that participated, 71% um, had um, actually applied for the PPP program. 56% looks like um, for the IDLE Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program and 19% for others. So uh, that's very interesting. So if we can um, so the conversation we need to have right now, you know, as a part of the $2.2 trillion uh, coronavirus stimulus package known as CARES Act, $349 billion were allocated to small businesses initially as loans, PPP, as the Payroll Protection Program administered through the Small Business Administration, was authorized to provide small businesses with loans to pay eight weeks of salary, benefits, and other eligible costs. Those loans will be forgiven if a business restores its full employment and salary levels by June 30th. Dennis, can you join me on, on camera for just a moment? Many small businesses jump, jumped at that opportunity and within 13 days, the funds were completely exhausted. Dennis, you were minding your own business last Thursday, matter of fact, helping clients understand um, needs. And we heard the headlines, PPP runs out of money. As my friend Sally Tucker tells me, capitalism without capital doesn't work. So what were your clients telling you? Oh, a number of things. Uh, one of the things was that the, the portal in their, in the, at their bank wasn't working. Uh, mm -hmm. they, were, they were trying to get their loan in. Many of them hopefully got their loan in. Cause I, was, I was calling around doing some anecdotal type of surveys to find out, did you get your money? Did you get your money? And... Um, Many of them I talked to, they were, they were quite disappointed. Uh, but there were some who, 
who who did receive their funding, and so that was great to hear. Um, yeah. And uh, we uh, we we look for the we 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 are very hopeful for the next round and and look forward to talking to uh, to uh, Mr. Antonio Dawes about yeah. um, what what's to come. Yeah, what's happening next? So, um, mm -hmm. Antonio, if you can join us on screen, that would be great. Uh, we certainly appreciate it. We we know that you um, life is happening in the fast lane for you. So we appreciate again that you that you're returning to us. Um, again, and if if you could, let's just settle, um, just um, level set for just a moment for folks that are listening to us and, and viewing us. Can you explain to um, people for, if they're joining us for the first time what the the loan programs are that we're referencing in this chat? Can you talk about this just a minute? Sure thing. And good morning again to uh, to everyone. And uh, Dennis, good to see you as well now. Um, so the, the programs that we're talking about are the Paycheck Protection Program, commonly referred to as PPP, our Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, we refer to it often as EIDL, and then there's the EIDL Advance. So the Paycheck Protection Program is really the program designed to help small businesses keep their employees employed and not to have them uh, lose out to unemployment and once we get back to uh, normalized times, uh, helping those businesses not have to go and then try to figure out where their employees are, can they rehire them, can they get them back on board, but to keep them gainfully employed and to keep them in a position where they have funds to spend money for their life needs, uh, whether it's groceries, rent, you know, mortgage, whatever it might be. So again, the principal focus of that is about payroll, and short-term working capital for leases and things of that nature. The funds in that program went up to $10 million and it had an interest rate of 1%. Our economic injury disaster loan program, which is one of our standard disaster support programs that we offer, uh, that program uh, is, was capped at $2 million. Uh, we actually use those funds again for working capital, short-term borrowing needs for including things like payroll and utilities and lease expenses and other things that are common suppliers expenses that you might have. And those funds actually had a 30 year amortization for short term working capital, which is very much unheard of. And then the third component is the idle advance. So this is the amount up to $10,000 per employer, which is essentially a forgivable amount that once uh, the business applies, they could get that, that amount of money, essentially $1,000 per employee with a maximum of 10,000. And those dollars are used to, again, help with the working capital needs that the small businesses might have. Okay. And so what we were just talking about in terms of in two short weeks, it was kind of out of money. Can you give your, your perspective about kind of what happened? Yeah, well, we saw uh, just a tremendous onslaught of uh, people, business owners who needed money to run their business. Uh, there was a lot of concern obviously out there. The pandemic and all the uncertainty that comes with it uh, spooked a lot of business owners and you know, rightfully so. We've never had across our entire nation uh, something like this happen in our lifetime for sure. So what we saw was uh, business owners who were eager to be able to get access to the PPP loans, uh, we have businesses that applied also for the economic injury disaster loans and the economic injury di disaster loans advanced component of it. So we saw all of those being uh, very uh, heightened in terms of awareness. There was a lot of information in the public media about the new programs, and some of it was uh, very clear and obvious to the lenders and to the borrowers as to what they needed to do. Some of it actually was unclear, and so you know, our office saw a, a considerable amount of phone calls and emails. Uh, we held a series of webinars and discussion sessions to try to make sure we push the information out to everybody so they would understand exactly what the programs did and what they didn't do and to help guard against misinformation where people, not by intent, but sometimes would also provide information that wasn't current or accurate. And then if you're not careful, the business owner got misled as to thinking the program will go one way or the other. Mm -hmm. so, so Antonio, what should businesses be doing to prepare for any upcoming loans? 
your question? Yeah, so um, basically right now, uh, get your financial statements in order. Um, you know, both of these loan programs uh, used a streamlined underwriting approach. Uh, with the PPP program, it was really about your payroll. You know, the banks needed to know what your typical payroll is, and we're essentially taking two, two and a half times that typical monthly payroll amount. So for businesses, they need to be able to demonstrate uh, if this program gets funded again, what the actual dollars of their payroll uh, are for on a monthly basis, including um, not only just the actual pay part of it in terms of the, the, the uh, pay amount that is made, but the benefits uh, component of it in terms of health insurance, and other expenses that are also part of that uh, paycheck amount. Uh, likewise, if they're looking at the economic injury disaster loan, if there's funding again for that, it's similar. You need to be able to have documentation that shows what your business is. Um, in this case, we're, we're looking at your gross profit. Uh, gross profit was our determinant. So uh, again, for businesses, uh, it's your total income minus your cost of sales. And then underneath of that, you have other expenses that are day-to-day -day expenses, utilities, et cetera, uh, that are your uh, operating expenses. And then at the very bottom is your net income. So we're talking about the higher number, the gross profit, uh, which is you know typically uh, pretty sizable. And we were using a factor of two times the um, average monthly gross profit as a basis for those loans. So we may or may not have that same posture going forward, but that's what it was in the past. Mm, that, that's very, very interesting. And so you talk about going forward. So do we know right now, and I know that it's hung up on Capitol Hill, but do we know right now what it will take to, in, in this next leg, um, to apply for either the IDLE or the PPP loan? Do we know? Yeah, you know, I need to, to, to kind of pull out of the drawer here my um, congressional crystal ball. <laughs> which uh, I don't really own one of those, and I don't know if anybody has one that works really, really well. But from all accounts that we hear in the media, the news, uh, you know, there's been you know, a series of press announcements and such. It sounds like members of uh, Congress are working uh, collaboratively to figure out a way to put additional funding forward so we can have money uh, for both of these programs. Uh, but as I caution uh, all of our associates in our office and, and others in the, in the marketplace, you know, literally until a president signs legislation, you, you can't really act on it. There's no funding until you get signed into law. So we're awaiting that point in time. We're hearing that it could be as soon as the next day or so, uh, but we'll, you know, we'll wait for that to actually happen before we can really say exactly how we're going to implement. I, and I know that you can't predict, but you're about as close to the equator as we're going to get on this, right? So. Uh, <laughs> Dennis, what I was thinking is that we would, we we're going to open this up to other people, but um, Dennis, we have another poll, right, that we want to take to kind of gather information, right? So if we could um, just quickly take a, um, a, a poll in terms of um, our next question here. Did you receive approval for it for your fund? So if we could, if you can quickly, we can watch as this occurs. If you, ladies and gentlemen, can um, do that, and then we're going to open this up for questions from our general audience. Did you receive approval for funding for either the, the payroll protection program or the idle program? Ah, it looks like as I'm looking. As I live and breathe, right now it looks like the polling progress and the responses that we're getting that 80% of the people that we have online, and we have almost 200 and almost 260 people online here, um, is saying like 80, 81% and growing have. Um, ah, okay, here are the results. We asked that question of 250, 60 odd people, and 81% of you said that you were awarded um, in the payroll protection program, and 19% of you said that you received funds in the the idle program. That's interesting, right? Mm, that is real, very interesting. Yeah, real time data collection. So let's yeah. move, if, if we could, to open it up to um, our our audience. 
And um, if we could do that, uh, um, Sonia and Kenneth. Thank you, Sharon. Um, uh, Mr. Doss, uh, I guess it's the other 80% of people want to know where the money is, because uh, mm -hmm. most of our folks are, are asking the question, I think I was approved. Well, I definitely put an application in, but I've not received either the advance uh, nor the uh, full uh, loan. What is the status? How do I find the status? Yeah, so there, you know, of course, there's these three different streams of funding. And so the Paycheck Protection Program that went through the banks, uh, as we typically do our guaranteed loan programs, the economic injury were direct loans from SBA to the borrower, so no bank involved. And the economic injury uh, advance uh, component, the amount up to $10,000, uh, was actually through SBA as well, uh, directly, so that the banks didn't have to approve that part of it. Uh, so it looks like you know we've we've done better with the um, PPP loan program. Uh, with the economic injury disaster loan program, you know you kind of have to understand as well that uh, SBA is not staffed to handle a whole nation's worth of loan applications at one time. Uh, we typically build up our staffing for disaster related things as they come on board. You know, sometimes with things like hurricanes, you have advance notice that something is coming, we can start gearing up. So we've done a lot to, to try to put ourselves in position to be able to meet the demand, but the demand has been very strong and uh, we've revamped a lot of our underwriting approaches and other things. Uh, we are still processing and working through uh, a number of applications. And it's our understanding that as these next couple of days and uh, maybe a week or so comes along, we'll have more of those answers uh, initiated and awarded in terms of, uh, of loans. Uh, the other part to it is that uh, we had always anticipated about a three week approval period for the economic injury disaster loans. So we're, we may be close to that in some cases, and we might be a little bit behind that in some cases. Uh, so you know, we're, we're continuing to massage the process and uh, try to be more responsive. We've done a lot of up staffing uh, and integrated some other components to help us process quicker, but the volume was significant and it has affected our ability to turn around loans as quick as we wanted to. Dennis, did you have another question before we take one from the audience? Well, um, uh, my question was lessons learned and I think that you kind of answered that uh, in there. So please, let's go to the audience. Okay. Thank you, Dennis and Sharon. We do have a question from Ms. Denise Rolock Barnes. Uh, Antonio, she wants to know, uh, she said, uh, she, what happens if she submitted a PPP application but was forced to lay off an employee because of the delay? Will the company be penalized for that? Well, it's really a function of what did she have when she submitted her application? So let's just say you have 10 employees normally and that was the basis for the loan application. If by the time you're ready to um, go through the full eight week period and Denise uh, or whoever in this uh, similar example is able to hire that person back on board, uh, then you've essentially fulfilled that 10 person um, uh, uh, standard, let's call it a standard at that point. Um, so we know that sometimes sometimes you're going to have people who are going to um, not be able to bring back on because you may have lost a contract or other things. We also know that sometimes employees will say, you know what, I'm going to do something different now. I'm moving out of the area or whatever it is, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to be under your employment. It doesn't matter if it's exactly the same John Doe, who's the person that's the employee, as long as your numbers turn out to be about the same, you're still fine. Great. Thank you. Antonio. Let, let's take another question and then um, we want to reconvene all our speakers and open it up to the broader um, audience to ask live questions. So if we can take a few more questions, guys, that would be great for Antonio. Uh, Antonio, one question has to do with the uh, disparity for minority businesses. Is there any, was there any uh, plan uh, or do you anticipate any plan to make sure that the next round of loans uh, uh, go more to the small and minority businesses? Yeah, you know, for the uh, disparity piece, uh, you know, we haven't actually seen, uh, I haven't seen data that tells me what that number looks like, uh, whether it is uh, 
consistent or inconsistent with normal you know lending uh, results so it's hard to hard to speak to where it is with these particular programs because i don't have that data point uh, available to, to me at this time uh, i do understand from some of the discussions on the hill that there are some components that may come into this new legislation specifically related to uh, some of the groups that aren't always able to participate in the uh, the economics of programs like this and so we have to wait and see exactly what that is the framers of the legislation will be what dictates what we're able to offer you know they have to create the law we develop the regulations and the procedures to implement it but it starts with what what the focus is of the legislation okay one more question So Antonio, uh, what, what, what do you what do you see for uh, if if we continue this for the next eight weeks? What are you, what is your recommendation to businesses? Yeah, you know, if, so if we continue this longer, because you know we're in the D.C. metropolitan area, you know, who knows exactly how long this is going to be for us? You know, one is uh, get prepared for financial support if it's available, whether it's through us, if the states or the county or the district or others come up with additional funding. You know, consider those kind of options uh, to keep your employees on on board. Uh, we also would recommend that you take a really good look at your your overall business strategy. Uh, right now, um, for some businesses, it's a little bit of a quieter period of time. Uh, it's always important to do your strategic thinking around how do I make adjustments as a business owner. Uh, some of those will be pretty obvious in terms of the adjustments you might make depending on what type of business you're in. Uh, one of the things I'm always recommending is you look at the, the diversification of your revenue stream. Uh, do you have enough things happening in enough different buckets so that you're, you have effectively a risk management plan for revenue? And if you don't have a risk management plan for revenue, uh, you're subject to getting your business hurt if some part of that revenue stream, particularly if it's a dominant part of it, hits a hiccup uh, like you know we've seen for the retail side of the places uh, right now with uh, the stay-at-home orders it makes it difficult for restaurants and retail to, to, to function well government contractors in a different spot i think now you see a lot of people wanting to be government contractors because <laughs> they feel like this is this is a safe haven but even within that looking at diversifying your revenue is always a very good strategy for business Right. And, and um, as we bring back on, and thank you, Antonio, we're going to bring back on Jorge Castillo and we're going to bring back on um, Curtis Brown so we can open it up to a broader audience. One of the things that, Antonio, we've been telling our businesses is that, you know, at this point in time, I know that we're in survival mode, but we are instructing them to, to begin to put together their 90 or 100 day recovery plan as we come out of this, as we will. You know, if you're pivoting, um, in order to in, um, to another industry or whatever that is, but to also understand that once this, and as, as they say, this too shall pass, which then is going to be your strategy mm -hmm. for business. And so I'm asking right. everyone to join us back as we then now open up the lines. Um, we're going to open up the lines to, to um, unmute some of our callers and so that they can uh, come on live and ask some questions as well as we'll continue to ask um, Ken and Sonia to feed up questions as well. And so do we have, um, Curtis, are you back as well? Yes, I'm on. Okay, thank you, Curtis. All right, here we go. Thank you, Sharon. I was just scanning the room and it looks like we've got a question from Wendell Carter. Wendell Carter. Wendell, I will open up your unmute your phone so that you can ask your questions to the prospective panelists. Hello. Good morning, Wendell. Good morning uh, to all. Thank you. This has been very informative. My question is, we were approved by Citibank um, on the Friday that the PPP was open. We got the approval letter. And since that time, we have not heard anything from Citibank or no funds have been deposited to our account. Can you explain uh, if this is a, a abnormal or are the funds still on their way? 
All right, so this is, this is, I'm assuming this is for me, so I'm taking it. Uh, it's a great question, Wendell, and uh, one that uh, requires a little bit more understanding. So there are a couple of different things that happen with the PPP loans, the Paycheck Protection Program loans. The bank can approve you internally and say, okay, we think we can do this loan for you. That's nice until they actually submit the loan to SBA and get a authorization number back from SBA, which essentially says we are, we're holding X number of dollars for Wendell and his business, then the loan hasn't really been officially approved as a PPP loan. Now, once the bank receives back that authorization number saying that we've, you know, we've locked these funds for Wendell and his business, technically the bank has 10 calendar days to actually issue those funds and close a loan with you so that you can actually get money. So if it's longer than 10 days, um, it shouldn't be because that's built into our regulations. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to really reach back to your lender, your bank and say, okay, you know, it was approved on X day, uh, X number of days ago, and what's the status? Because there's a 10 day requirement. Does that help okay. clarify it, Wendell? I think um, we may have. This phone has been muted, Tanya, but thank okay, you for your sorry. question. Hopefully that helped, Wendell. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, I have a uh, a question for our emergency management personnel, and I'm opening the line for Mr. Michael Garcia. Good morning, Michael. Uh, it's not opening. Okay, Michael, you open. Can you hear me? Yes. Michael, we can hear you. You're, you're okay. on live. You're on live, Mike. Yeah, my question was, um, we're, we're linked up with a lab out of Florida that can do testing of 600 people an hour and just wanted to get that information to an agency that could possibly use that capability. Michael, I would say, at least for Maryland, please send uh, please send that info to the Peace Sector email, p-s-e-c-t-o-r at maryland.gov. Okay. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll make sure I, I send a note to, to the group to be on the lookout for that um, so they can expedite it, expedite it appropriately, too. Sounds good. Thank you. And uh, this is Curtis in, in Virginia. Uh, likewise, my contact information is at the end. Uh, just want to let everyone know we're we're constantly getting uh, uh, potential, you know, testing capabilities and others. We do have to vet them to make sure that they're approved as being uh, uh, legitimate testing sources. And so this is what we do with all of them. So they have to have the appropriate, uh, you know, FDA or CDC uh, approvals, uh, and that is part of our process as well. So. It's, it's important probably on the front end to make sure that that is occurring. Uh, but yeah, please do uh, send that information to us as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, for you. Your Thank you for your question. Next question, please. Thank you, Sharon. We see have a hand raised from Ms. Leona Charles. Luna, Leona, I am going to unmute your line so you may ask your question to our panelists. All right, good morning. Um, good morning. Quick question. So you you guys spoke a little bit about um, having emergency funding in place as a form of risk management for your company. So my question is, is we have we have two alternative sources of lending uh, because we are a government contractor. One is obviously through our bank, um, and another is through um, a non-bank lender. Uh, we use uh, Cabbage and PayPal. Uh, what we've noticed is that um, our bank wasn't able to quickly respond to any requests for increased funding um, and when they did respond it was nominal it was kind of like a, under a thousand dollars that they could get really quickly um, and our non-big lenders um, kind of froze all of the credit lines so how how does a particularly a small business you know stay afloat when we kind of set the appropriate channels to help us out in in emergencies and those channels shut down. I'll take it. 
Yes. Antonio? Uh, just to, to, for, for clarification purposes, uh, any of the participants in the PPP program would use the exact same underwriting scenario. So it shouldn't have been a difference between the two. And I, I don't think that's what you're implying happened in your case. It sounded like the um, the banks took a risk mitigation plan and said, and the and the non-bank lenders did as well and said, we don't have as much confidence in whatever is going on that we want to limit our risk. So we're shrinking what's available to you as a credit line. Uh, it really kind of goes against what the federal regulatory agencies have pushed for lenders to do during this time. We've actually pushed in the opposite direction to allow uh, banks to act and other financial services uh, partners to permit you to have additional flexibility in your loans, to allow you to delay loan payments uh, for several months and to do uh, adjustments to your loan or your um, your loan in terms of a modification. So it's disappointing to hear that that you had that double whammy happen. I'm hoping that you did apply or um, were able to apply for either the PPP or the idle loan. The other piece, if you're in a really in a working capital need or for some additional uh, expenses beyond just the short term, uh, I do want to point out that as part of the CARES Act, we have a small business debt relief component which means if you're an existing SBA lender, borrower, or if you're planning to take out a new SBA loan, not one of the disaster what? loans, but a regular 7A, the first oh, yeah. six months of your, the first six months of your uh, payments will be paid by SBA, including your principal interest and your fees. So that might be another way to get some cash into your business without having the pinch of having to make those payments right away. Thank you, Antonio, and thank you for your question. Now, unfortunately, we have uh, we have reached the bewitching hour of 11 o'clock. As a matter of fact, we're a couple of minutes after. But I just want to remind our um, viewers and our listeners that we have materials that will be uh, available to you on um, our website, uh, which is www.mbda. Um, FPC, and that's our Federal Procurement Center website, where we are housing all of our webinars and materials from it. I'd like to again thank our panel. And you know, it just does my heart really wonderful that these folks that are in the front line as relates to capital and emergency was able to take the time out for us in order to um, provide you with this information. Again, we will answer all questions that will be that have been submitted and we'll hang that up our website. Follow us on social media at CRMSDC is our handle. And I'd like to, again, um, um, where, that's where you will find the material. You, you saw that, and you will also have the contact information that we were referencing today. Uh, we have other webinars, uh, webinars around our network. Um, our headquarters in MSDC does one every Thursday and some of my colleagues across the country with MBDA and the, the um, the NMSDC work network. I'd like to thank um, Grable Media for um, its production of today's event. And so again, thank you all for tuning in and we'll see you the next time. Have a good, good day. Stay safe and stay healthy. Bye -bye.